Okay. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all doing great. Um, thank you for joining us this evening for our live stream presentation. Um, Southwest Pollinator Conservation with Xerces Society's Caitlin Haas. Um, I'm Kristen. I'm uh, new with PEAK. I'm a director of interpretation and um, I'm going to be moderating this presentation tonight. So um, the Los Alamos Nature Center is currently closed, but we still have lots of ways to interact and connect with the environment, um, like presentations like these. So if you want to know a little bit more about what's coming up and what we're doing, please check out our website, which is uh, peaknature.org, P-E-E-C, nature.org. And uh, just a heads up, after this program, we are going to be sending out a survey. Please just take a second and fill out the survey and let us know your thoughts. Um, surveys and answers from you, let us know how we're doing with our programming. Um, and of course, we always have to give a shout out to our members and donors. Um, it's because of your generosity and support that we were able to offer programs just like this one. So um, if you'd like to learn more about donating to PEAK or becoming a member, again, visit our website, peecnature.org, peecnature.org, and uh, see what it takes to become a member. Um, just a couple front of house logistics. Tonight's program um, is presented by an awesome presenter. Her name is Caitlin, and um, she's going to have her video on. I'm going to ask everyone else to leave your video off. But if you have a question, please type it in to the chat. And you can find your chat icon at the bottom of, if you have a computer, at the bottom of your Zoom screen on your toolbar. Just, just touch chat, just touch the chat icon and um, send your question directly to me. And at the end of the presentation, we will have um, time for questions and some live questions that Caitlin will answer. So without further ado, I'm going to do a little um, intro. So this is Caitlin. You can see her face. Hi, Caitlin. Hello. <laughs> she is the Southwest Pollinator Conservation Specialist with the Xerces Society. She's working to create climate resilient connected pollinator habitat in Santa Fe and Albuquerque. She collaborates with and educates public and private urban land managers in New Mexico and the desert Southwest on pollinator friendly practices from, for landscaping, gardening, and open space restoration. Caitlin holds a master's degree in environmental science and policy from Northern Arizona University, where she studied impacts of drying on aquatic invertebrate diversity in natural and man-made, <laughs> human-made ponds. Woof, mouthful. Before graduate school, she worked as an ecolog ecological science technician in a variety of systems across the US, including predator prey ecology in Michigan, riparian restoration in Virginia, and rare species monitoring in Massachusetts. Caitlin, we're so happy to have you tonight, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing what your presentation. Great, thank you so much, Kristen, for that intro. and being the moderator for this speaker series. I'm really excited to be here and um, be working with PEAK. You guys are a really great um, organization, educational organization, and I'm glad to be working with you guys. So um, let me get my video out of the way here <laughs> so I can present this. Um, let's see, okay. So like Kristen said, this is a presentation on Southwest Pollinator Conservation. And I am Caitlin Hotze, I work for the Xerces Society. And just to give you an idea of what we're talking about today, I'll do a brief overview on pollinators in the Southwest and their importance. And I will talk about what you can do to support pollinators through creating and improving habitat. And I just want to acknowledge, um, I did a big webinar series, Xerces did a big webinar series with uh, New Mexico State University recently. Um, it was a six week series. 
I'm sure um, a few people on here probably saw that. And if you did, this is a lot of repeat, but um, it's still like a nice condensed version of what we learned there. So um, feel free to type questions into the chat box as they come up and we'll get to those at the end. So first off, I wanted to, um, if you aren't familiar with the Xerces Society, we are an international organization dedicated to the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. We have staff in regional offices throughout the United States. Our main office is in Portland. And my position in the Southwest, <clears throat> uh, this first regional office in the Southwest just happened in May. So we're really excited to be here in the Southwest. I'm really excited to be here and to get to know all of you. And um, we work to conserve invertebrates. So a lot of our work is dedicated to insects like pollinators, like bees and butterflies, fireflies and dragonflies, but also other invertebrates like snails and mussels. So just animals without a backbone. And invertebrates make up 94% 94% of species on Earth, and they contribute to a lot of crucial functions in our ecosystems like pollination and seed dispersal, decomposition, and they're also a huge uh, food source for many other wildlife. And you might be wondering, what is Xerces? Why, why did we choose this name? So our name honors the now extinct uh, Xerces blue butterfly. So this um, blue butterfly here uh, on the left, um, it, is, it was a butterfly species found only in sand dune habitats in the San Francisco Bay area. So um, after all the development in that area, the dune habitats were um, paved over, they're gone. This was one of the first invertebrate species to disappear in the U.S. due to habitat loss and uh, human development. So by naming ourselves the Xerces Society, we're honoring uh, the loss of that species and we're dedicating ourselves to science-based work to protect invertebrates. Um, and we have programs focused on pollinator conservation, endangered species conservation. We also have a pesticide program and a communication and outreach program. So now that you know a little bit about Xerces, let's talk about the pollinators we work to protect. Now there's a lot of bats and some birds, or a lot of birds that pollinate flowers here in the Southwest. Um, but most movement of pollen between flowers is carried out by insects. And this includes insects that you probably already know of as pollinators like butterflies and bees, but also other groups which may not immediately come to mind. So things like moths and wasps, beetles and flies. And all of these different insects visit flowers to eat nectar and pollen, but our bees, our female bees are visiting flowers to collect pollen to feed their offspring. Um, I wanted to quickly do some general pollinator ID in case you're wondering what uh, you've seen in your yard lately. So um, these are just really broad generalizations. There's always exceptions in ecology, but um, Peak, uh, their website also has really great um, butterfly and insect ID guides. But here are just some like kind of general rules for identifying some pollinators. So for Adult butterflies, they are typically active during the day. And the way you can tell them apart from moths is that they have a clubbed antenna, which basically just means there's like a um, larger, thicker part of the antenna at the end. Whereas uh, if you look at this moth here, our favorite little Miller moth we all love so much, um, they have a thin, and it's a little bit feathery and a very just like thin point to the end of their antenna. So that's a really easy um, ID between butterflies and moths. A lot of moths are active at night, but that's, um, you know, not all species are only active at night. Uh, so there's always exceptions. Um, and then for larval butterflies and moths, which you might know better as caterpillars, 
that's where the lines blur a little bit more. There's not anything that's very, um, like that makes it a butterfly or a moth. But um, our larval butterflies, butterfly caterpillars are usually not extremely hairy. So if you see something that's just like a furry puffball, then that's probably a moth caterpillar. But um, larval butterfly, uh, ca butterfly caterpillars are a little, sometimes have spines and little fine hairs, so hair can't be your exact identifying feature. And then with our larval moths, they can be either very, very hairy or they can be smooth too. So if you're familiar with um, like uh, tomato hornworms, those are a moth, it's a sphinx moth. Um, so yeah, for example, here I have a monarch butterfly caterpillar, it's smooth, and then I have some uh, milkweed uh, tussock moths here, and they're very hairy, and that can, it's kind of a generalization that um, a lot of moths, caterpillars are hairy, but um, if you look at the peak insect butterfly and moth guides, there's lots of really great examples of caterpillars on there too. Now, again, doing general ID tips for our other pollinators, um, I just wanted to quickly distinguish honeybees from our native bees. So honeybees are non-native and they're domesticated species. So honeybees have a social caste system. So you're probably familiar that there's a queen and workers in a bee colony. So these bees live in large hives with uh, thousands of individuals and on a commercial scale honeybees are typically managed a little bit like livestock. Um, we ship them around to different parts of the country where crop pollination is needed throughout the year. So they're just um, a little uh, you know uh, weird example of a bee um, in the U.S. but our native bees are uh, extremely diverse and they vary drastically in size from tiny little sweat bees all the way up to big giant bumblebees that are over an inch large and also carpenter bees are really big. And they, our native bees are usually hairy, that's a good identifying feature. And most of our native bees are solitary, so a single female bee will collect all of the pollen she needs for her eggs. She doesn't get any help from anyone else. And um, a lot of our native bees are also short-lived. So they're usually only active as adults for six weeks or so. And our exception, our ecological exception to native bees is uh, bumblebees. Bumblebees live in a small colony that is active from spring to fall. So they aren't solitary and they live um, throughout the year. Now wasps are typically not hairy. That's one good like identifying feature between our wasps and bees. But there are lots of bees that aren't hairy and they look almost exactly like some wasps. So not a, not a perfect ID feature. But they're usually um, much slender looking. They have a narrow waist. And usually they're predators. Um, there are definitely some that drink a lot of nectar and pollinate, but many wasps are, are predators. And wasps and bees are in the same um, order of insects. And flies are in a different order, so they're a little easier to tell apart. Um, bees and wasps have four wings that they kind of fold over the back of their body, whereas flies have two wings and they t stick out in this kind of V uh, on their back. So if you see um, this fly here, it kind of looks like a bumblebee, but its uh, wings are kind of at this V angle across its back. And they also have really large eyes that are more situated on the top of their heads, whereas the bees and wasp have their eyes a little more on, to, on the sides. So hopefully you are like, oh, I saw a fly that day or a bee that day. But if you go to the peak nature guides, you can really get a good idea of um, the different bees and butterflies we have in the area. So all of those insect pollinators that I just talked about, they visit flowers to eat nectar and some of them eat pollen. But female bees specifically collect pollen to feed their feed their eggs 
So they actively collect and transport a lot of pollen with them moving from flower to flower. So this means that most bees are really efficient pollinators compared to those other insects. And a lot of bees have really specialized hairs or body structures for collecting pollen. So for example, this picture of a leaf cutter bee here has lots of pollen collecting hairs on the bottom of her abdomen. So you can see her bottom of her, uh, the last segment of her body here is just chock full of pollen. So they can just flop right onto an open flower and move around and collect lots of pollen quickly on the belly. And another feature that makes bees uh, more efficient pollinators is that they do this thing called flower constancy. So once a bee has learned how to quickly collect pollen from a specific kind of flower, it tends to return to that same type of flower over and over again. So that means it's visiting the same kinds of flowers in a species usually and not moving pollen from different species. So there's a little bit more um, poll better pollen transfer between uh, the same flower species. So native bees are extremely diverse in the US. We have about 3,600 different species of native bees. And you can see from this graphic that some families are really diverse. So like our uh, cuckoo bees, those are like a parasitic bee. And like our minor bees, we've got just a huge diversity of a few different um, families of bees. And one reason, one reason that Xerces is really excited to have a regional office in the Southwest is that this region is a hotspot for bee biodiversity. So there was this study all the way back before New Mexico was a state in 1906 that published there are um, over a thousand species of bees in New Mexico. And I think uh, California or Arizona might have a few more species than us, but we're definitely in the top five states of native bee species that has native, the most native bee species. And when we think about uh, native bee research in the Southwest, there's a few good examples of some long-term studies and some more local studies. Um, so Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in Southeast Utah has had a lot of bee uh, research and documentation going on. And so has the Sovieta uh, Long-Term Ecological Research Station. Um, that has had lots and lots of uh, bee research at those two sites in the Southwest. So you've seen, they've been able to document really large fluctuations in population of bees and document lots of different species here. And for other pollinator research, um, New Mexico State University um, Agricultural Science Center at Los Lunas, they've done quite a bit of pollinator research and beneficial insect research, as well as the Plant Materials Center with the um, USDA, they've, they've done a good amount of uh, mostly looking at what pollinator plants attract the most species. And then for a little more local taste, we have um, a grad student, Adrienne Rosenberg, who is with University of New Mexico, and she's working on a project um, to create pollinator habitat in Acequia irrigated fields. And we also have, um, if, if you know anything about bees in the Southwest, you've probably heard the name uh, Olivia Carroll. Uh, Dr. Olivia Carroll's done um, most of the bee research in Northern New Mexico. And she's done surveys in Bandelier and the Rio Grande del Norte Nas National Monument. So those are, that is what we know really for most of the Southwest, which has an incredible diversity of bees. So there's definitely a lot we still need to learn. And I'll tell you at the end of this presentation how you can help collect some pollinator data where you live. So now you know who the pollinators are. Let's talk about why they are so important. So they're very important for natural systems. They allow for reproduction of plants. Plants can reproduce and reseed in their environments. Those seeds and fruits 
of, of flowering plants are also important food sources for many other types of wildlife. And the pollinators themselves are really important food sources. So about nine and 10 bird species eat insects at some point in their life. So these are really important for the base of the food chain. And uh, for example, specifically caterpillars or the larval butterflies and moths, they're an incredibly important food source for many birds, especially when feeding their young. So caterpillars really feed most of our uh, baby bird species. And in addition to helping feed wildlife, bees really help feed us too. So a great visual of how much pollinators contribute to foods we eat. This is an example where we partnered with uh, Whole Foods. And this is what your typical produce section might look like when you go out for groceries. And this is what it looks like without foods that depend on pollinators. So over half of the produce items are missing from the shelves, including a lot of the foods that uh, provide us with lots of essential vitamins and minerals. So produce is gone, but that's not all. Pollinators are really essential for the production of some of our favorite vices. So coffee plants and cacao trees require insect pollination to make coffee and chocolate. And knowing how marvelous chocolate is, it may come as no surprise that the flower of this planet comes from is also amazing. It's this really gorgeous little flower here, and it is pollinated by this little bitty midge. So this is a kind of fly. So every time you take a bite of chocolate, don't forget to thank this fly and all the people that helped get that chocolate to you. And you might be aware that uh, pollinators internationally are on the decline. So um, a lot of our vertebrate species are facing extinction, but even more of our invertebrate species are facing extinction. And this is why the Xerces Society is really trying to advocate for invertebrate conservation at local uh, urban scales up to really large national international scales. And to address these species declines, we really need to know what the causes are that are making these declines happen. So why are these pollinators in decline? The key factors for pollinator species are habitat loss, pesticide use, disease, and climate change. So many of the causes of decline are impacted by human behavior, which means that we are responsible for the declines, but because it is our behavior, we can change that and be able to um, address these declines. And specifically in New Mexico, habitat loss and climate change are particularly threatening to native pollinators for a few reasons. So the central driver of pollinator declines is habitat loss and degradation. And this can look like uh, changes of major ecosystems, like grasslands turning to shrublands, or it can be um, expansive pesticide use. And one component of loss is also habitat conversion. So if you have um, intensive agriculture or if a landscape is just not pollinator friendly. And then we have um, that pollinator contamination. So an area that may have really great resources for uh, pollinators, lots of flowering plants. Um, if that area is contaminated by, by pesticides, then it is not good pollinator habitat. So we need to think about how um, these different losses in habitat due to uh, urbanization or conversion of habitat. Um, and we also have uh, things that just degrade habitat. So things like light pollution that can really affect our moth populations. So um, there's a lot of different elements of habitat loss and you can address um, a lot of them by improving habitat or removing a disturbance like light. So um, when 
Good pollinator habitat is few and far between. That means that pollinators cannot move from good habitat to breed or to escape threats. And that's called fragmentation. And roads and cities and farms can really fragment habitat. And we know that if we can connect that habitat, we can really improve um, movement and breeding and gene flow. So if we can create little corridors through our uh, really developed areas, and then that can really help out our pollinators as well. And in regard to climate change in the Southwest, especially, we're already experiencing higher temperatures and more extreme weather, which are resulting in warmer winters and drier summers. Um, seasonal activity of species is projected to change differentially with um, life cycles being disrupted and those interactions being disconnected. So like a bee might emerge from its underground nest, but the flowers it depends on might have already bloomed based on our increasing temperatures. So that's one big issue is this disconnect between um, timing of biological uh, events. And then there's also um, these big shifts in vegetation and um, fire regimes and how frequent droughts are. These can also really impact um, habitats of pollinators and their ability to survive. So this image here is of a study done in Bandelier National Monument and it was after a severe drought in the 1950s and the red shows where ponderosa pine forests were replaced by pinion juniper woodland and these drastic changes at this really large scale on this landscape are can be really difficult for pollinators to adapt to they may not be able to um, shift that suddenly after just a few, a couple years of drought. So just keeping in mind that um, oops, pollinators, uh, while they are quite resilient and hardy, they may not be able to shift with how quickly we're experiencing changes in the southwest. The good news is there are things we can do to reduce the risk of these threats. We can improve and create habitat by planting a diversity of native plants that attract and support many different species. We can reduce our reliance on pesticides and we can limit disease spread by uh, reducing risk from managed species and we can prepare for climate change by planting diverse climate resilient plants. And in order to conserve these, uh, we need to know what they need in their habitat. So when we're thinking about conserving pollinators, we need to think about what do they need, and that is their habitat. And almost all types of habitat can make positive contributions to the abundance of pollinators. So these big undeveloped open spaces are really important for maintaining our robust populations and diversity of pollinators but uh, pollinator habitat can occur at all scales from an entire national forest to a really small herb garden on your porch. So developed areas like city parks and roadsides, your backyards all the way up to national forests, national parks are really important for pollinators and they basically just need three key elements uh, to have what they need. And those three elements are flowers, so food in the form of nectar and pollen, shelter for nesting and overwintering, and then a safe place from pesticides. So if you have all of these three elements, then we can help benefit pollinator uh, populations. So, Habitat is really key in our landscapes. As I mentioned earlier, there's been, we've had a lot of loss and fragmentation that is causing uh, extinctions across all kinds of wildlife and plant species. And even our common species that we don't think of worrying about going extinct 
um, they are experiencing major declines. And that really restricts the amount of big ecosystem services that they do. So are really common pollinators, even though we're probably not worried about some of them going extinct, there's a lot of work that they are doing that is declining because of their populations going down. But the good news is, is that pollinators can really use small spaces and they don't need, um, you know, a big expansive uh, plot of land to complete their life cycles. So a small improvement can really have dramatic effects for a lot of species that are more generalist. So uh, this example of the Western bumblebee here, it's like, it was like a very common species across the Western United States, but its populations have really plummeted in the past few years. But um, even at urban sites in like in the Pacific Northwest, we're seeing that just some uh, flowering resources that are late in the year and um, having a greater diversity of flowering resources can help support uh, species like this. So we have big natural areas that are core sites for our wildlife and they can support many specialist and sensitive species. And these areas do still need some um, care. They can't be degraded too much by overgrazing or severe wildfires, but we know those places are able to support a lot of our pollinators. And, but we also have habitats in our cities and towns, and I'm going to tell you a lot about how you can use the spaces in your yard and how you can make those good pollinator-friendly habitats. So like I mentioned earlier, since um, pollinators can use smaller spaces and uh, urban areas that have had a lot of um, degradation, we can create pollinator corridors and um, build habitat through areas that have experienced a lot of habitat loss. And there are a few um, programs that are working on this, like the Albuquerque Backyard Refuge Program is um, helping folks build habitat for all kinds of backyard wildlife in, uh, in Albuquerque. Santa Fe is hoping to start a pollinator trail soon. And then I'm sure folks in Los Alamos are interested. I've talked to a few of you after the big uh, New Mexico State webinar series and um, doing what you can in your yard is, is a really easy way to support pollinators. So what do we need to do to help create that habitat? So the first element is forage. So the main source of food for pollinators is nectar, pollen, and other plant material, both for food for adults and for larvae of, of our insect pollinators. So what we really want to think about is how often do we have uh, flowering resources for our pollinators across seasons. So most insects live really short lives and different species of insects live those short lives at all times of the year. So you'll have some species only emerging in spring and living for a short amount of time or in fall or in summer, and then you also have some that, like bumblebees, that live throughout the entire year. And all of those different species will need flowers to uh, live throughout their life cycle. And when we have all of these different flowering resources from across uh, spring to late fall, we can really help to boost those different uh, populations. And that can really help support abundance and diversity. And I can give you a few examples of plants that are uh, flowering at different times of year. So this is a really nice document created by the uh, Plant Material Center at Los Lunas, the Natural Resource uh, Conservation Service. 
I'll throw a link in um, later for getting to this plant list. But basically they looked at um, a bunch of different plants that occur in New Mexico, when they flower and how many pollinators they attracted. And you can see that um, based on whatever species of flower you're looking at, there's this bloom season here. And you can see that uh, there are lots of different plants that offer um, blooms at different times of year. So that's just something you wanna consider when you're choosing the different plants for your yard, which ones bloom early in the year, which ones will bloom for a really long time. Making sure you don't have any big gaps in blooming is what you really wanna aim for in providing habitat. So the importance of native plants, I wanna talk about how native plants are the better choice when you're looking for um, pollinator habitat. And the reason is that native plants have co-evolved with our native pollinators. So a lot of them depend specifically on a certain plant family it's um, just really been evolutionarily ingrained for certain pollinators to visit our native plants. And generalist species can take advantage of some introduced plants for sure, but um, there are also some other reasons why we'd like to choose native plants. So our native plants are really adapted to local conditions. They evolved in the Southwest. They can handle our drought they can handle our really hot summers and cold winters. So just looking for native plants can reduce any kind of amount of care you might need to put into your garden. And they can also have fewer pest problems. So they've also evolved with pests of the region. So if you bring in um, a bunch of introduced species that aren't used to the pest of the Southwest, um, they may not be able to do as well, but our native plant species have evolved some defenses to deal with some of those pests. And just to give you an example of some different flowers, some native plants that have provide blooms from uh, really late winter, early spring, all the way to late fall. We've got um, white prairie clover, some uh, different pinstamens. I think this is Rocky Mountain pinstamen, um, tansy leaf aster, globe mallows, um, dahlia, and uh, uh, blanket flowers. Sorry, I can't read. It's tiny on my screen. <laughs> um, and some different mints. There's a lot of different native plants. If you look at the um, uh, what is it? Are the Natural Resource Conservation Service um, plant table I showed earlier. There's a lot of great things to mention or to pick from from there. And you can plant all of these different things that will be blooming from late winter all the way to late fall and support lots of different bee species and butterfly species. Um, one other thing you want to consider is providing a diversity of shapes and sizes. So not all pollinators are the same size or um, are as great at accessing sunflowers. So like with our really deep flowers with really hard to access nectar reservoirs, those are good for things like um, hummingbirds and moths and butterflies that have like a very long straw to get down to the end of these flowers. And then other small pollinators like beetles and small um, bees will use things like carrots, these little bunches of flowers that they can easily move around on. Um, just create, um, providing a diversity of sizes and also different plant families is really important. So a lot of species um, specialize on just one plant family, sometimes even just one genus of plant. So if you can provide lots of different um, plant families in your garden, then that can support more pollinators. Now, some introduced species are okay. 
I know we typically try to push native species, but um, you definitely want to have like a foundation of native species and um, you want to really avoid anything that could be invasive or escape cultivation. So um, one really easy way to figure out what pollinators are really um, attracted to in your area is just to observe, take a walk around your neighborhood, see what um, is visiting lots of different plants. I know in my yard, there's a lot of bees on my blue mist spirea. I definitely see a lot of things on the red hot pokers. So just, it, it's really useful to use just some anecdotal um, observations to get an idea of what is attracted right where you live. So um, it's okay to use some introduced species, but you really want to avoid anything that is aggressive and could take over your garden or leave your garden and seed elsewhere. So another important thing is that um, we have a lot of insects visiting to collect uh, nectar and pollen, but we also need host plants for our caterpillars. So butterflies and moths, their caterpillars need a specific host plant. And those can be, some are a little more general and can eat on any kind of grass or um, any kind of oak tree, but some are really particular. So you might be familiar with monarchs and how they need milkweeds. So um, our milkweed species, native milkweed, are um, obligate plants for monarch caterpillars. They need, that's the only plants species they will feed on or plant genus they will feed on. And not only are milkweeds um, really important for some butterfly and moth species as host plants, they're also really great high quality nectar sources for pollinators. So um, they provide really good nectar and then they are also really great for attracting beneficial insects. So things like lady beetles, uh, parasitic wasps, pirate bugs, all the things, all the pre predator insects that will be eating the pests that you don't want in your garden. So milkweeds are all around, just fabulous. Try to plant them if you can. And then just to give you an idea of some other specialist bees and plants you could include in your garden to help those bees out. We have uh, a genus of bee, Diadasia which are cactus and mallow bees, and they really um, are attracted to our prickly pears, our choyas, and then our globe mallows. Um, so there are specific bee species that will pollinate all of your cactus plants and globe mallow in your yard. We also have uh, squash bees in a couple different genuses. So um, your garden squash are usually getting pollinated just by these squash bees that are visiting really, really early in the morning. Um, our other native squash like coyote gourd, those are an important native gourd species. So um, you can plant those things if you want uh, to help out those specific bee groups. And then just to highlight another group of pollinators, we have nocturnal and crepuscular pollinators. So nocturnal being active at night, crepuscular being active in the evening. And this includes moths, most moths, there are some daytime flying moths, but um, most moths and then some bees and beetles and bats in very really southern Arizona or New Mexico. <laughs> So um, one species or one genus of flower that is really popular with our nocturnal uh, pollinators is evening primroses. So obviously evening means that they are uh, often a lot of the times those flowers open later at night or they become more fragrant in the evening. A lot of them are white or pale in color and that just makes them easier to see for our insect pollinators in the dark. So that's one plant. They're, they're also just really nice and pretty to plant in your yard. So um, 
just an example for some nighttime pollinator plants. This is Epimopsis um, and a evening primrose. And then I have this example of a hummingbird moth, a sphinx, white lined sphinx moth. So if you've never seen a hummingbird moth, it's a really, really exciting thing. And hopefully if you have some um, flowers specifically that are uh, great for hummingbird moths, you'll get some in your yard. So flowers aren't the only important thing. Our native grasses can really provide structure and they help soil um, infiltrate more water. So, and they're also really important host plants and shelter for butterflies. So a lot of our uh, gramma species of grass, blue gramma, um, black gramma, they are really great for um, hosting pollinators. Um, specifically skippers and other butterflies. And they also can provide nice structure for overwintering bees and um, can even create little tunnels underneath them for uh, bumblebee colonies. So grasses are a really critical um, habitat element in the southwest. And we have a lot of native grasses that can be really ornamental too. So not just having a yard full of overgrown grass, you can make it, you can make it look nice if you're really concerned about um, what your landscaping looks like. So one plant to avoid is anything that is really cultivated. So double, double flowered hybrids and other really um, showy, flashy looking hybrids don't produce a lot of nectar or pollen. So um, those are usually bred just to make us uh, really appreciate them and um, they look really nice, but they may not be supporting or providing much to our bees and butterflies and other pollinators. And yeah, you just want to really kind of avoid anything that's especially double petaled. Those are usually don't even um, produce nectar or pollen. But there are some things like a lot of our herbs and um, other variety, garden varieties can look really pretty and provide pollen and nectar. And like I mentioned before, if you look at flowers around your neighborhood and around your yard, you can really get an idea of what is really working in your local area. So um, a lot of herbs like dill and lavender, basil, um, if you let those flower, I know you want to keep them making your herbs for as long as possible. Um, those will still be really great uh, pollen and flower resources for your, the pollinators in your yard. So when you're picking out your plants for your pollinator garden, um, one thing you really want to be aware of is making sure that you're sourcing native plants, that have not been treated with pesticides. So a lot of seeds and other plants might get treated um, in early stages where they're being uh, grown, not at your local nursery, but they might be shipped somewhere. Um, some nurseries aren't able to get that information of uh, where products used to treat those seeds. And you just wanna be sure that uh, your, pest, your pestis or pollinator friendly labeling on plants doesn't guarantee that there were no pesticides used in treating that. So basically the best way to address this is just to have a conversation with um, who you're buying plants from, talk to local nurseries, um, just tell them you're concerned about um, buying plants that could be treated. And if um, they can help you uh, select plants or provide plants that have not been treated. So, and another thing you can do is just also collect seeds from plants you have growing in your yard. So that way you know that you haven't sprayed, you know the history of that plant, and hopefully that will um, prevent any kind of pesticides uh, being coming out of your pollinator plants that you're providing. So 
And one thing you can do in designing your pollinator habitat is just to plant in clumps. So bees really like to uh, visit flowers they're familiar with and they only visit a few flowers on a single trip. So if they can collect all of their pollen from a single species of flower in one area, then that is just a lot more efficient for them. And um, it's just easier for them to get to the different plants that they are collecting pollen from. Another thing you can do um, in your garden is just to put up some signs that say you're uh, doing making pollinator habitat, just let your neighbors know. You might be concerned that others might think your yard looks messy, or maybe you just want to spread the good news of creating pollinator habitat. Um, putting up signs is a great way to engage and educate others about uh, creating pollinator habitat in your yards. Another thing you'll want to consider is your space when you're selecting plants. So the south facing side of your house is going to be much different than the north facing side. And you'll wanna identify microclimates within your yard and make sure that you're selecting plants that are you know, shade tolerant or good for clay soils or sandy soils, depending on what your yard consists of. And then also consider water use. So can you plant something um, that can soak up a lot of water where you have a lot of water running off your roof. Um, so just considering your space and what uh, plant species could work best in that area. And also in the same vein is considering climate resilient options. So selecting drought and heat tolerant plants, um, getting creative with your xeriscaping. We have lots of native plants that are able to survive our super tough conditions here. And also including diversity. So including diversity can really help um, if some certain plants in your garden are just not doing well that year. Hopefully you have some other plants that um, are still managing through whatever non-monsoon we might be having. So just consider um, what is able to adapt to our uh, climate and you know don't don't try and plant something that is really high elevation um, if you're in a really low elevation area. Another little thing you can do is um, provide some water. So when sources of water are aren't present, you can um, put out a little dish with rocks in it with water and just um, empty that every once in a while. A lot of butterflies and moths and other uh, some bees will drink from uh, some water that you can provide. Um, another thing you can do is provide some wind protection. So our pollinators are usually pretty small and can get blown away um, easily. So if you can provide um, any kind of windbreak trees or shrubs, those can help um, provide shelter and nesting and overwintering habitat, as well as just give them a break from uh, any really windy areas um, while they're foraging for pollen and nectar. So shelter, we talked about forage. Now we'll talk a little bit more about shelter. And one thing that's really simple to do is just identify existing areas in your yard that are um, already providing shelter. So not trying to create um, a whole new area is, um, that's fine. But if you can preserve the places that are already good shelter, so things like um, stems, plant stems, leaf litter, plant or grass tussocks, brush piles, rock piles, snags and stumps. If you can leave those where they are, that's ideal. Um, but leaving any kind of um, kind of uh, protected rocky plant waste area can really help um, boost overwintering sites and nesting sites for pollinators. So 
one thing that we can really do to help uh, improve our lawns and rocks is just to re remove lawns if you can. So um, grass lawns really provide very little in the way of habitat and they use a lot of water, which is really not climate smart for us in the Southwest. And if you can replace your lawns or rock mulch with flowers, you're going to be providing um, nesting sites and forage sites for lots of insects, including pollinators. Um, but if you can't say no to your lawn, you can also just uh, reduce mowing and allow for some clover to grow. And that will do a lot more than a very uh, clean shaven lawn all the time. So if you can just reduce mowing, um, that, that is one way to help make your lawn more pollinator friendly. Now, when we're thinking about shelter for nesting bees, well, I wanted to mention a few different kinds of bees that um, will be needing nest, basically. So we have ground nesting bees. That's about 70% of all the different native bee species we have. Um, we have above ground tunnel nesting bees, the, the things that nest in stems and little cavities. And then we have uh, bumblebees, which nest in bigger cavities, like old rodent holes. So if you're not sure if you have bees nesting in your yard, um, these nests can kind of resemble um, ant nests, like little piles of dirt in the ground. Um, bees like to nest in where there are bare patches and kind of well-drained areas with sand to loamy uh, soils. And the best thing you can do for ground nesters is just to leave some areas undisturbed, leave a little bit of bare ground um, where you can, and avoid any use of landscape fabric or heavy mulching over an entire space. You just want to leave a little bit of area for the, them to access the ground and also um, emerge once uh, spring comes around. And thinking about these stem nesting bees, there are um, a few different places where they can nest. And that's typically in twigs like in sumac or other shrubs, there are these twigs that can either be hollow or pithy, which is just kind of like spongy inside, so they can burrow down in there. And um, if you can leave some brush piles and logs and tree snags, you'll definitely have some um, nesting habitat available through those. And then one thing you can do with um, your more annuals or perennial plants, um, is leave stalks over winter. So you can um, prune back some uh, stems, like you want to leave a few different heights. If you can select stems that are um, a little thinner and a little wider, you'll um, provide more stem habitat for different uh, sizes of bees. And there's no need to clean them up. The stems eventually break down and the bees will continue to use them until they break down. And there are also these little bee houses. Um, I've heard that they don't work super well in the Southwest, maybe in more wet areas where there's um, a little more vegetation, where bees have, um, there's a lot more cavity nesting bees. Uh, you might get some action in these houses, but there's a lot of ground nesting bees in the Southwest. So these artificial tunnel nests, um, you might have good luck, you might not, um, but you really want to uh, make sure you clean them out and don't put a bunch in one area. You want to try and avoid um, spreading any disease or funguses through those sites. And for butterflies, kind of similar concept, you want to leave um, undisturbed areas, leave some brushy plant areas, and make sure you have larval host plants for caterpillars to um, feed on, and then hopefully they um, 
chrysalis or some even some butterflies overwinter as adults, but um, just leaving an area that where they can be protected and not disturbed is what you need to do for butterflies and moths. And then in particular, pesticides are um, a really simple way to uh, avoid um, causing damage to your pollinator habitat. So avoiding any pesticide contamination is something you really want to strive for if you're creating pollinator habitat. So one thing about using pesticides is there's a disease or a pest you're trying to manage for. And to really prevent use of pesticides, trying to prevent that from happening and responding to that underlying issue. So one easy thing to do is just cut out any kind of diseased part of the plant you might see. Um, just mechanical hand removal of pests is a simple, easy way to get rid of them for the time being at least. And then making sure your plants aren't stressed out. So making sure they're not being overwatered. They have good airflow between plants. It's not a good place to harbor pest and disease. And then another thing you can do is create this more resilient and diverse ecosystem. So creating space for beneficial insects is a great way to um, help prevent pests. And then also just realizing that um, you can tolerate some plant damage. So the pollinators that you might want to be creating, creating habitat for can do some damage to your plants. So this top picture here is of rose leaves that have been eaten up by some leaf cutter bees. So um, yeah, if you have leaf cutter bee damage, then I mean, that's part of your pollinator habitat is allowing those bees to collect those materials for their nest. And then also I have a little um, caterpillar here and uh, just realizing that caterpillars, your butterfly larva are needing those plants to um, fulfill their life cycle. So just realizing that your pollinator garden is going to be eaten at some point. Um, and then there is also this concept of conservation biological control, which is allowing for um, native uh, beneficial insect species to eat the pests that are in your yard. So they have really similar needs as pollinators, just allowing for kind of nest sites, protection sites, and you can find a lot of information on this. Um, on the New Mexico State University Integrated Pest Management uh, website, IPM is what we call it. And you can find out a lot more about um, beneficial insects and pest management. Um, another thing to consider is managing weeds. So if you remove a lot of weedy species, you might be removing habitat, floral resources, and just learning to tolerate some of those weeds is one thing you can do. Um, and avoid using herbicides whenever you can. So using mechanical methods, pulling them out is a lot better than using herbicides. Your herbicides can um, drift and affect other plants nearby that might be important for uh, pollinators um, like nectar and host plant material. So if you do decide you have to use pesticides, um, try to follow the principles of IPM, which is Integrated Pest Management. So figure out why your plants are unhealthy, what's affecting them. Make sure you know what you're spraying for in the first place. And um, only spot treat pests and do not apply to flowering plants. If you can avoid applying anything to flowering plants, that's the best way to go. So those are the three main principles of food shelter and protection from pesticides. And just wanted to mention that um, you can apply this at many different scales from your yard to um, a, a countywide 
if, if you needed to. So the principles are all the same. So just thinking about what you can do at your neighborhood scale and eventually um, if a lot of us do that, we can build to a local scale and then also supporting any measures that are um, protecting pollinators at a regional scale is a great way to uh, help promote pollinator habitat. So some things to consider is just landscape context and habitat corridors, but basically you can create habitat just about anywhere. So your backyards, farms, community gardens, roadsides in particular, lots of different places are able to support pollinators. And pollinator habitat also improves habitat for other species. So not only are you providing um, bees and butterflies a home, you're providing birds and uh, other insects, other backyard wildlife can take advantage of a yard that is full of pollinator habitat. So um, without healthy populations of invertebrates, our birds, our fish, amphibians, and many other species can lose a key source of food. So um, you can help provide pollinator habitat and provide food for all of these different wildlife. And not to mention that um, creating more uh, climate friendly landscaping can really reduce um, excessive water use and uh, really helps provide a more resilient ecosystem that can result in fewer pest and less pesticide use. So I have a whole bunch of different resources here that you can refer to to find pollinator friendly plants and help for gardening and making these plants thrive in your yard. We've got the um, Native Plant Society. Peak website has some really great identification guides if you need help there. Um, and I can uh, make sure this gets to everyone that signed up for the webinar. And another thing you can do is collect data as a community scientist. So there are a lot of different um, community science programs out there where you can identify or just take simply taking pictures of bumblebees, monarchs, milkweeds, and um, posting those online. There's um, all these different websites and I know Peak just finished up their Dorothy Horde Memorial butterfly count if you're interested in doing a butterfly count locally. And I also wanted to plug uh, the Bee City Bee Campus USA program. So it's a designation that a city or campus can apply to. And it's um, a really great way to um, show that your community is concerned about pollinators. And if you're interested in making your community a Bee City or Bee Campus, just let me know or research it online. Um, just so you know, Albuquerque is a bee city. It's our one that we have in New Mexico. There's a lot of information on our website at xerces.org about pollinator habitat and how to avoid using pesticides. We have lots of guidelines and reports, fact sheets, brochures, and we have one specifically for the Southwest. I'll be creating more eventually, um, but we have one specifically for monarch nectar plants. And I just wanted to thank you for attending. I also want to thank the Carol Petrie Foundation, um, which helps funds a lot of our work in the Southwest. And finally, Xerces Society is a member supported nonprofit. And I'd like to thank the, our members specifically that make our work possible. So uh, sorry for going over so long, but I would love to take any questions now. Hey, that was awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, of course. I'm really typing of questions. Um, oh, thank you. Sweet. So we do have a couple really good ones. Let me just zoom in here. Okay. So we have a couple questions about guides. So yes. Dorothy asks, um, is, are there any guides for identifying bumblebees? Um, preferably ones with colored photos. 
Yes, so actually, um, there's, what did I show just a minute ago? Um, so this bumblebeewatch.org has a lot of really, really helpful um, guides for identifying bumblebees. You just submit a picture and that can be thrown into their database, but here's one of their little um, guides that they make and they have images just like this on their website that um, is really, really detailed for identifying exactly which segments have which color on them and um, sizes, all different kinds of information. So that's, I would definitely check out bumblebeewatch.org. Bumblebeewatch.org, Dorothy. <laughs> um, okay, and from um, Ben and Charles are sort of both sort of asking about native plants. Charles is asking more specifically um, native plants that can grow in higher elevations, like for Los Alamos. Some mm -hmm. of the ones that you showed in the presentation, I guess, don't grow very well. Yeah, definitely. And um, then also native plant charts, like how, where is it, you showed a chart in the presentation. Mm -hmm. Where do they find that? Okay. So um, this study, let me see, um, let me go back here. The pollinator plant recommendations for New Mexico. It is um, New Mexico statewide, so it is kind of a little bit more lower elevation focused, but it does include things that you can um, definitely plant in Los Alamos that will do better. Um, and that has a lot of really great information. And I know um, you could probably ask your extension agent in Los Alamos. The Master Gardeners in Los Alamos are also a really great resource for finding those native plants. There might be, I'm sure there's probably a chapter of the Native Plant Society in Los Alamos. Not quite sure. Um, but they're, they're a really great resource for um, knowing what to plant in the area. And then as, as, as sad as it sounds, it's probably better to plant for things that are a little more adapted to low elevation and more arid situations because um, Los Alamos is probably going to experience higher temperatures and longer droughts with climate change. But um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm definitely hoping to create plant list for um, different cities within New Mexico and the different eco regions across the Southwest. So we'll eventually get more detailed guides out, but um, yeah, you've got some good local resources to fall back on. Cool. Um, and then we have a question about hummingbirds. Um, this person, Aiden, has been, um, has heard that hummingbirds are good pollinators. Um, what are some plants that could attract them or should they just hang a hummingbird feeder? Yeah, that's, that's very true. Hummingbirds are great pollinators and they're just super charismatic, especially out here. There's just tons of them and they're uh, um, really great for pollinating um, a lot of our, uh, I'm trying to think of um, what would be a good example. All I'm thinking of are introduced species like Jupiter's beard. I have lots of um, hummingbirds visiting that. But anything that is uh, red, hummingbirds are particularly attracted to red flowers, white flowers. They're, it's not super particular, but um, a lot of your penstemons would be really good uh, hummingbird plants. And, um, but you're putting up a feeder is great too. Um, that gives them a little bit more of a stable resource that they don't have to um, worry about not being there in case uh, the year isn't producing a lot of red flowers that they like. Got it. Thank you. And then um, my favorite question. Uh, one of the people that turned that tuned in, their little sister is watching with them and sh they're asking, um, how are ladybugs beneficial? Ooh, that's a very good question. Um, so beneficial insects, we call them that because they eat pests. So aphids, other little pest bugs that are eating our plants, eating our vegetables that we want to eat, um, 
they, these are insects that uh, will eat those insects and prevent them from eating our food. Um, so ladybugs as larvae, so beetles as larvae are these weird little squiggly, almost caterpillar looking things. And um, as larvae, they will eat aphids and as adults, they eat aphids. So basically they're beneficial because they eat the things that we don't want eating our plants. Nice, cool. Yeah. And just to make sure, I'm not sure if we answered it, um, the plant, the seasonal planting list that you showed in the presentation, where can people find that? So it is this NRCS plant materials program. Let me see if I can point my laser at it. So basically, if you just Google um, pollinator plant recommendations for New Mexico, this will be the first thing that comes up. It's also on the NMSU IPM website. Um, and if, you, if possible, if I can get uh, the emails from everyone who registered for this um, program, I can send a link with all of these resources on it. Cool. Yeah. Great. I think, let me just double check. Do we have any? Um, Janice uh, recommends The Bees in Your Backyard by Wilson and curl oh, that's an ig guide have you seen that oh she I has it. it right here <laughs> nice janice yes janice great recommendation <laughs> um excellent book amazing facts in here also if you um can find any talks by olivia carroll um she has some on youtube uh, i think the taos plant native plant society has a talk of hers on youtube uh, she's fantastic, um, and she is co-author of this for, awesome. yeah. Cool, so sweet. Thank you for answering those questions. Of course. Um, and thank you everyone for your questions. Um, so Caitlin, we wanted to thank you so much for sharing thank and you. your expertise with us tonight. Um, and uh, for everyone that is watching right now, we're going to send a survey away just to remind you, please give us your feedback and um, join us again for another program or look for Caitlin. She's always around. <laughs> so yes. um, our next peak program, though, is um, mid mid medieval, woo, hard word, medieval Islamic astronomy. And that's this Friday at seven. Um, it sounds like it's going to be a real awesome program. So remember, you can always go to our website, peak nature.org to learn more. Um, please visit the Xerces Society's website as well. And um, thank you everyone. And I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks for Thanks, tuning in. Thank you so much. <laughs>